I haven't done that in a while. Hey, remember acid rain? Acid rain is harmful to buildings, statues, forests, maybe even to people. Acid rain carries poisons like sulfuric acid. Acid rain. 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 Being an 80s kid, there were a lot of things to be scared of, like nuclear war, uh, razors and Halloween candy. This chick. It'll make you feel good. But somewhere on that list of scary things was acid rain. I mean, the idea of acid falling from the sky, that's, uh, that's evocative. But you never really hear about acid rain anymore. What was that all about? So the deal with acid rain is that it came from sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide that's uh, burned in emissions from fuel combustion, both from cars and from industry. Those various chemical oxides would then go up into the air, they'd mix with oxygen and water, and that would form sulfuric acid and nitric acid. And that would then condense into droplets and fall down with the rain. So while no, it wasn't like hydrochloric acid falling from the sky, melting the flesh of anybody that stands underneath it, um, it was corrosive and it killed marine life in some Canadian and US lakes. It even stripped forest bare in Europe and damaged crops in China. And the reason we don't hear about it anymore is because we passed laws that curtailed the release of those emissions and then we, you know, that fixed the problem. Go us. It's hard to imagine something scarier than acid falling from the sky, like, I don't know, if blood fell from the sky or something like that, that'd be crazy. Good thing that's never happened. Oh my. Throughout history, there have been many cases of strange or mysterious objects falling from the sky. Um, it's kind of a whole thing, actually. You might remember my video on the Oakville blobs when uh, strange gelatinous blobs fell on the town of Oakville, Washington, which is still unsolved, actually. Spoiler alert, this one has been solved. But it's still super weird. It all happened on the morning of July 25th, 2001 in Kerala, India. It was raining that morning. Nothing unusual about that. But Sri Vijayakumar noticed something strange when he got home. The rainwater that he was collecting in his backyard was red. Like, red. He talked to his neighbors and turns out the rainwater in their yards was also red, so it wasn't just his yard. He starts going around his neighborhood and asked around and he found out that this strange rain had fallen in an area that covered about 30 houses. So he and his neighbors started walking around trying to figure out what was going on and they turned out that like 30 different houses had been covered in this red rain. And it didn't just happen in one day. It actually happened sporadically for several days until September 23rd. And it wasn't just red rain either. There were all types of different colors, yellow, green, and black. And it wasn't the first time this had happened in Corallo. Something like this was also reported in 1896. Now some of these witnesses in 2001 said the red rain was followed by loud thunder and lightning flashes. That's just a thunderstorm, right? Other reports said that after the rain fell, many of the trees around the neighborhood shed their leaves, which then turned gray and looked like they were burned. So one of the witnesses who saw this was a guy named Godfrey Lewis. He was a physicist at nearby Cochin University of Science and Technology. He collected samples of the rainwater and he looked at them under an electron microscope. And he found something really weird. What he saw were red particles that looked like biological cells. But when he looked for DNA to kind of determine, you know, what these cells were, he couldn't find any. So of course he speculated that he had found We'll get to that in a minute. First, let's look at some of the other theories around this red rain, or what people began to call blood rain. So kind of like acid rain, some of the earliest theories was that the red rain was caused by some kind of chemical pollution. Like maybe some rust from a nearby factory or some chemical that was in storage somewhere, you know, got, got caught up in the air and then fell down with the water. The problem is that red rain happened way back in 1896 when there were no factories in India, and it hasn't just been in India, it's happened in other places as well. Like blood rain is mentioned in the Iliad, and the 12th century writer Geoffrey of Monmouth referred to it in his writings. Some thought maybe it was the rain carrying dust and sand from a nearby desert. You know, when that rain falls, it has a red color and it leaves kind of a thin layer of dust when it dries. Um, it's not a bad explanation. Or maybe it was ash from a volcano. Ash can stay in the air for a really long time. Sometimes mixing with water can turn it kind of red. Um, and this has happened before. Yeah, there had been an eruption recently in the summer of 2001 uh, in the Philippines at the Mayan volcano, so that's a perfectly reasonable theory. Or another theory is that maybe a meteor exploded. You know, people did say that there was a loud cracking sound before the rain started. But if a meteor caused it, then why would the rain have occurred over two months? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. 
In fact, really only one explanation makes sense in this case. Okay, not alien aliens, but you know, something extraterrestrial. Which brings us back to Godfrey Lewis. So when he was studying those droplets under his electron microscope, he found those weird cell-like structures, but he didn't find any evidence of sand or dust. But he did find, again, those weird red cells with apparently no DNA in it. So he published his results in the journal Astrophysics in Space in 2006, suggesting that the cells could be extraterrestrial. He suggested the possibility that they came from a comet that disintegrated in the upper atmosphere, that kind of rained these cells down into the clouds, and then the clouds, you know, rained them down the Earth. That whole seeding in the clouds thing would explain why it took place over, you know, several weeks instead of just all falling at once. And he did point out that the rain seemed to land in an elliptical area of 450 kilometers by 150 kilometers. So he suspected that maybe a disintegrating comet would have flared out in that pattern. Specifically, the comet could have been traveling in a sort of a north to south and a southeast direction around Kerala. In the paper, he suggested that more than 85% of the red rain cases happened in the first 10 days after the airburst event. So it wasn't really that much of a time difference. In the study, he wrote, are these cell-like particles a kind of alternate life from space? If the red rain particles are biological cells of a cometary origin, this phenomenon may be a case of cometary panspermia. I've covered panspermia on here before, but it's the hypothesis that life is kind of prevalent in the universe and that it can be distributed by asteroids, comets, or meteorites. So he partnered up with one of the leading voices in the panspermia theory, a scientist named Chandra Wickramasinghe. So they studied the cells for a few years, and um, what they found was pretty extraordinary. Apparently, the cells can reproduce at 121 degrees Celsius, but they're inert at room temperature. In a 2010 study, they said, quote, the fluorescence behavior of the red cells is shown to be in remarkable correspondence with the extended red emission observed in the red rectangle planetary nebula and other galactic and extragalactic dust clouds, suggesting, though not proving, an extraterrestrial origin. But then a bombshell hit in 2013 when a paper was published in Microbiology that showed that there was actually DNA in these red rain cells. The researchers from that paper wrote, quote, Cellular impermeability to staining reagents due to the red pigment is likely the explanation for the failure of the previous efforts to demonstrate DNA in red rain cells. Stated in something slightly more resembling English, what they're saying is that the red coloring made it harder to find the DNA. Uh, but it is there. So they found the presence of DNA, but they still didn't know where these cells came from. Was it some kind of panspermia situation, or did it have a terrestrial origin? All I could do is just wait for it to happen again. And in 2014 in Zamora, Spain, it happened again. This time, rainwater samples found their way to the University of Salamanca, and there they studied the water and found particles Hematococcus pluvialis, which is a green freshwater alga. A green alga that does a little bit of a magic trick when it's chemically stressed. It turns red. The red color comes from a carotene pigment called axisanthin. The alga looks so much like blood and it's come down in the rain so often that its name literally translates to blood rain alga. But the blood rain in India was actually a different algae called Trentipolia annulata. So, mystery solved, right? Except no, it's not, it's not completely solved. T. annulata isn't native to India. In fact, it's believed to only exist in Austria. So how did it make its way to India? It just went where the wind took it, man. Yeah, that's right. It just, uh, it just hitched a ride on some clouds that eventually made their way to India. Yeah, apparently there were some really heavy rains in Austria and the species grew a lot. It released a ton of spores into the air and then elements in the spores reacted with elements in the rain, which then turned it reddish brown because of that chemical stressor. Oh, and that alga that fell on Spain? Yeah, it, it traveled from North America on a cloud, same way. So it's not always aliens. In fact, it's, it's, it's never aliens. We should really probably stop saying that altogether and actually do the work to figure out what the ins and the outs of our world are. Because this red rain situation is mostly harmless, but other things aren't so harmless. Like, have you ever heard of valley fever? It's an infection you get by breathing in spores of the fungus cockadoodle-doos. Cockadoodle-doo. Nailed it. The spores can survive heat and drought and often just kind of hang out in the soil, but when it's stirred up by things like construction, walking, or wind, they get lofted up into the air. They're mainly found in the southwest U.S. In fact, 97% of U.S. cases of valley fever report in Arizona and California, like the valley area. Go figure. But the same way the red rain stuff is getting up in the clouds and flying all over the place, this is now increasingly being diagnosed outside of that area. And this is going to happen a lot more. 
A study in the journal GeoHealth predicted that because of climate change, of course, valley fever could spread to the east across the Great Plains and north of the Canadian border by the end of the century. Oh, and small problem. Uh, there's no current vaccine for it. So, yikes. But hey, we fixed acid rain, so maybe we can do it again. So what are your favorite stories of weird things falling from the sky? Um, ever experienced it yourself? Talk about it down in the comments. So valley fever may or may not become a new plague, but one thing that has been a plague for a while now, email spam. And uh, it's, it's just getting worse. Email spam, junk mail, uh, spam phone calls, texts. I don't know about you, but it's gotten so bad for me in the last year that it's actually kind of starting to affect my livelihood. No, I've actually missed or lost some really important emails and letters this last year. And by important, I mean things like from the IRS. Because, you know, the day that I got it, I got 20 spam emails, or, or the letter got buried under a pile of unsolicited junk mail. Now seriously, one time I was sent a catalog from some store that I'd never shopped at or ever heard of, but the mail guy accidentally, like, wedged an important tax document in there, and I threw it away by accident because, I don't know about you, but I basically just opened my mail over the trash can at this point. I get so many spam calls that I had to set my phone to ring only when it's a recognized number, so of course, you know, anytime I'm trying to schedule a meeting with a, with a contractor or something and I don't have it already in my phone, if I leave a message with them, I miss their return calls. Yet companies who call you back from a different number than you used when you call them are like the bane of my existence. Now, I checked this a few weeks ago. I looked and, and over the course of the last 20 calls that I received, only two were from actual people. And I was getting like eight or nine phone calls a day, sometimes within minutes of each other. Do you hear the frustration oozing from my pores? So look, I'm on YouTube a lot, like I'm sure a lot of you guys are, and I've seen a lot of creators talk about this company called Incogni, uh, and I was really curious about it. My buddy Matt Farrell did a sponsor with them recently, and I, I actually wrote down on a notepad to reach out to him and ask about it, because uh, I could use some help with the whole spam thing. But actually, before I got a chance to reach out to Matt, Incogni actually reached out to me to ask about sponsoring a video, and I was like, hey, you know what? Only if it works, because I'm the ultimate test subject. So I signed up for it on their website, which by the way, took literally five minutes, no exaggeration. I was busy that day, so I blocked out 30 minutes for that task in my little planner thing. No, five minutes. I just went and ate a banana after that. But before I get to the results, and I do have some results, I, I, had, to, I had to find out why this was happening to me. Like, what did I do wrong, you know, to make this happen? And the answer is nothing. I did nothing wrong. I didn't do anything. I'm just guilty of existing in 2023. So the way it works is every time you buy something online, every time you go sign up for something, every time you put your information into a field somewhere, they can then take that information and sell it to a third party. A company's called data brokers. And then these data brokers will put your information into like a demographic or geographic or behavioral bucket, right? Like they might take my info and put me in a bucket for people who live in Texas or for men who work in media who are over 40 years old or for people who like 90s hip hop and have four heads the size of three story buildings very specific buckets. But then these data brokers will turn around and sell these buckets of people to marketers who are looking to target that specific bucket of people. And voila, spam, lots of spam, spam a lot. Somehow this is all perfectly legal, by the way, with one caveat. The caveat is you have the right to request that those data brokers remove your information from their buckets. Like it's, it's actually illegal for them not to once you ask for it. The problem is, there's literally hundreds of these data brokers and it's impossible to actually reach out to all of them and then you got to follow up with them because the next time you're on the internet you put your information somewhere you're right back in that bucket and that's where incogni comes in they have powerful automated systems that reach out to hundreds of data brokers at a time and file requests on your behalf instantly and then they do it the next day and then the next day and the next day until you are clean literally within seconds of signing up they had reached out to 76 data brokers and 15 of them had removed my information. I wasn't even done with my banana yet. And at the time of recording this, it's been about a week. So I actually went back and looked about a month ago to see how many spam calls I was getting on my phone. I counted and I was getting 21 a week, a month ago. And this last week since I signed up, I've only gotten 17. So that's a decrease of 20% in one week of signing up. And if you're curious, they give you a little dashboard here. You can see they've sent out 75 requests. I've been removed from 28 and put on suppression lists for 14. There's 47 of them in progress. So, and, and it's only been a week and they're gonna keep doing this and it's just gonna keep getting better. And by the way, it's not just for nuisances like spam and junk mail. They can also get your information off of public databases called people search sites, which identity thieves can then use to get a hold of your info and 
ruin your credit rating, drain your bank accounts, or worse, threaten your safety. Yeah, the problem with spammers and, and data pirates has become so pervasive, I'm actually starting to think that we've reached a point that you kind of have to have a service like this, that just to be functional in the world anymore. I mean, spammers have just ruined everything. So if you've been dealing with this problem as much as I have, I'm telling you, this is the best solution that I have found so far, and Cogni is totally the real deal. So if you want to give it a try and get 60% off an annual subscription, you can sign up at incogni.com slash Joe Scott, enter the discount code Joe Scott when you check out. You'll see it going to work immediately, and you'll see the results within weeks. Like, I kind of can't believe it's already gone down one-fifth in less than a week. Anyway, again, it's incogni.com slash Joe Scott, discount code Joe Scott at checkout. I'll put the link down in the description. And yeah, thanks to Incogni for supporting this video, but uh, also just, just for existing. I'm glad this thing exists. All right, thanks a lot for watching. If this is your first time here, maybe check out this video on a somewhat similar topic too. I'll put the Oakville Blobs video up there because it's similar in, in tone and whatnot. Um, or check out any of them that might be over here on your sidebar if you're watching on your computer. And uh, give them a like, give them a click. If you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I do come back with videos every Monday. But anyway, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, stay safe, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.